But before we get started and we get all happy and excited, unfortunately, um, some uh, breaking news, breaking, breaking, breaking news has um, spread across the interwebs. And unfortunately, um, one of my um, favorite people in fashion and somebody who I kind of looked up to and who I gained a lot of inspiration and motivation from and um, somebody who kind of really personified what it meant to be uh, a eccentric to the fullest uh, point of view he was somebody that was unbridled in his talent unbridled in his um, creative ability um, came, he was probably the best giver of interviews ever that exist in the creative field and generally an all-around legend um, Karl Lagerfeld unfortunately has passed today at the age of 85 um, he is the he well he was at the helm at Chanel and Fendi and a few other projects that he had underneath his belt. He was the true um, antithesis of a Renaissance man, a polyglot, whatever you may call multidisciplinary geniuses. And just in general, just somebody who I immensely looked up to just in terms of being a creative powerhouse. Again, I think I mentioned a few times on this podcast that my introduction to fashion was quite weird. I didn't come into fashion um, following avant-garde designers um, like uh, Comme des Garçons, um, of like Ray Capcuma or Comme Garçon or Maison Margiela when that was going on at the time or Helmut Lang. I didn't get into fashion that way or even with Ralph Simmons. I came into fashion uh, through the super commercial end of the uh, end of the totem pole because I ended up tapping into fashion from reading the Sunday Times magazine. And they had a style magazine on the inside of the Sunday Times edition. And that's like my first introduction to what fashion meant. And the reason why I liked it was because that then gave me the pathway to start reading British Vogue and then US Vogue and stuff. And I liked the balance between, um, you know, artistic expression and commerciality, right? I like that balance that these big designers, such as, you know, Tom Ford and he was like Gucci, somebody I followed that for a long time. Somebody who was able to um, express what they wanted to express creatively, right? Um, you know, give them, um, imbue little nods that would um, only be recognized by fashionistas or people that are obsessed with fashion, or people that are obsessed with art, but then also be able to appeal to the, you know, to the mum in the middle of America or to the, you know, to the older gentleman that lives in the middle of Paris or somewhere, right? Somebody that doesn't necessarily know what the codes are, doesn't necessarily know where the lineage comes from, doesn't necessarily know the inspiration, but they just love the garment in itself. And I think that's one of the rare talents that Karl Lagerfeld was able to imbue. And of course, um, it seemed like the older he got, the more workload he took on, right? The resort collections, um, the collaborations with high street and brands such as um, H&M. He was the first person to do that, which nowadays is like a rite of passage for a designer because, you know, I do remember even, do you remember when Comme de Garçon did the collaboration with H&M, how, how much stick they received, especially on forums that I used to read back in the day, like um, the fashion spot, which I think is still around now, but I used to go on the fashion spot quite a lot back in the day. And I remember um, Ray Kyle Kubo was getting ripped apart from pillar to post because, you know, she was somebody who was adv um, firmly against um, fast fashion at the time right she kind of uh, adopted the quite a few strong stances when it came to wastage and fashion and a lot of political opinions that kind of went against her decision to kind of you know get in bed with H&M and do a collaboration with them but of course the the kind of long-term goal of that collaboration was to you know in general like get the public aware of what Come the Garson were doing so that when Dover Street Market took off and started becoming this multi-label platform that loads of brands could come then and and go on top of customers will be familiar with the brand so the idea of kind of marketing your brand by doing these high street collaborations is something that was new but Carl Lagerford knew that was something that he needed to tap into and essentially he turned himself into he kind of re, he kind of was able to reinvent himself off the back of that collaboration and reintroduced himself to like a whole different group of people who never knew anything about him so much so that in his later years he did a the recent club recent documentary actually that's on netflix i recommend you check it out it's called seven days out and it follows a, a bunch of people a bunch of kind of individuals from their varying, varying fields such as chefs and whatever they may be and they are building up to present something whether it's a dinner whether it's a fashion show and it kind of um, goes through the entire process of the build-up towards the final event and it's very eye-opening and again it's something that only came about during it's only it's something that's only been shown now during his later years so it seemed that the older he got the more projects he took on the more things he was doing and then through those projects he was doing, he was he was um, getting himself a new audience. He was exposing himself to new people who were, who were just fascinated with this older gentleman who was able to work so tirelessly all around the world 
um, on various different projects with various different people and various different demands, but still remain quite free. That was a weird thing. Like it never seemed like, even though some of the, you know, later designs were not necessarily people's favorites and people had a lot of things to say about whether or not they liked them or not. You can never argue that he was doing anything for just the sake of doing it. Um, everything seemed like he was doing it for a purpose. There was an idea behind it. Um, um, there was a freedom about it. Um, he he seemed creatively free. I'm not sure what's happened behind the scenes, but it didn't seem like he was um, beholden to the sales figures that were going on in his house. He kind of just did what he did and hoped people kind of resonated with it. And for the large part, they did. You think about the fashion shows he did, the you know the spectacles that happened, for, especially towards the end of end of his time at Chanel. The fact that some of his fashion shows will cost more, more would you know his one fashion show will cost more than you know the whole operation of one fashion brand on the up and up. Um, just in general, just a completely a complete freak of nature, and somebody in in you know in all with all respect being said, and some of my favorite quotes from Karl Lagerfeld that I just pulled out here that I want to read out to you. One is. There is no secret in life. Um, the only secret is work. Get your act together and also perhaps have a decent life. Don't drink, don't smoke, don't take drugs. All that helps. Because again, I think there was, a, it, there was a time where, and this comes in the face of, this really kind of rankles against what a lot of these kind of, you know, newer designers are kind of complaining about. Because, you know, there are some, there are some um, valid complaints when it comes to the beast that is the fashion industry, the demands it puts on young designers, um, the needs that they have to meet, um, the fact that some of these designers are coming into it really young, like somebody I profiled the other day, uh, Grace Wells Bonner, is only 28 years old, right? Um, somebody like her being kind of thrust into the limelight and being told to take over this big house and all the demands that come with it. It's a lot to ask, right? But there, are, there is also, and I, there is also and part of me that kind of thinks that from most of these guys that came before these young designers have had to put up with as much pressure, if not more. And fair enough now we have the added, you know, the added mental pressure of social media and that malarkey, but the actual business sort of fashion has always been cutthroat, has always been uh, do or die, has always been sink or swim. It's always been like that, but there's been a very few amongst that group of designers who have been able to kind of ride the wave and, if anything, who kind of really... um who kind of live for the pressure, live for the moment, live for live for doing it. Because at the end of the day, you know, like as I'm, I'm just a fashion enthusiast. I'm not a designer myself, but um, I know I can just imagine how lucky you'd feel to have a job that you necessarily would do for free, right? We all we've all been sitting in our rooms, cutting up magazines and dreaming about you know making the collection or dreaming about attending a show or dreaming about interviewing a designer that we loved, right? There's all these kind of fantastical ideas that you have in your head, and then to suddenly kind of break through the third wall to suddenly kind of creep into that gated institution and make a career for yourself um, is something that you're mentally going to be grateful for. So there is a part of me that also thinks that sometimes a few of these kids that come into fashion and start complaining about the schedule, about the workload, they need to sometimes do, they seem to, I think they need to reflect on just how um, fortunate they are to have a career, let alone in an industry that they love, but in an industry such as fashion, that's just, you know, you're eternally dreaming. You're, as designers or people that work in the industry, you're, you are forever living in a kind of never never land right you never really grow up you're always living in this fantasy in this fantasy world that doesn't really exist within the real world um every few weeks or so you get to tap out and you know be amongst your peers at fashion week with all that energy around and i went to fashion week for the first time when i went to when i went to paris to go see virgil's off-white show the first menswear show and i was a little bit of a I used to kind of have my nose up in the air about fashion shows. Oh, what's the point? It doesn't matter. You can see the images online. But just being around the fashion, um, just being around the Parisian streets when fashion show was going around, the electric energy around the show, before the shows, during the shows, after the shows, outside, during the after parties, you get a real understanding of just how magical and just how otherworldly that whole industry was. And Carl Lagerfeld was able to operate in that industry for 50 plus years um, relatively at the top, um, um, steering a ship of a massive, massive fashion house in Coco Chanel, uh, taking, you know, with the ghost of Coco Chanel hovering over that brand. And he somehow was able to turn himself into this enigmatic figure that people were infatuated with, even more so than Coco Chanel. It's fucking incredible. It's fucking crazy how he was able to do that over time. Yes, he had his controversies. Yes, he had these um, wild things that he said over the years. But like, much like Eric Weinstein has said a few times, who's part of the intellectual dark web, I think we need to kind of, we need to, we need to be more willing to accept the eccentric the eccentricities of our, you know, the people that operate on the real edges of creativity. Ones, the ones that are really pushing things, the ones that are, you know, working ungodly amount of hours 
just for the love of it. We have to be able to be a little bit more understanding of the wild shit they may say because by and large, they're not like me and you, right? They are a bit crazy and we reward them greatly for it, for, for their craziness is able to kind of, you know, make new silhouettes, new shapes, new um, introduce new fabrics, um, raise up a different type of sensibility. Like even what you said, I think, remember once during, I think after the Chanel fashion show that they had for, I think the one they did in the supermarket. Do you remember when he made like a fake supermarket? Um, and you could essentially, I think after the show, he allowed everyone could just take whatever they wanted from the shelves, like a Chanel branded fucking lemonade and shit like that, right? I remember he said after the show, something that really resonates, something that really kind of touched home and was something that I've kind of always thought about, especially when all these fashion insiders were kind of trying to poo-poo uh, streetwear, right? Was that um, he said something about luxury and he said something along the lines of like, oh, um, luxury is no fun if you're just treating like your Sunday best. Luxury is is an everyday way of life, right? Luxury is like what you wear to the supermarket. It's all about like that. That was his idea of luxury. So he's, I think he was saying something along the lines of like, um, we you can buy like a you can buy into Chanel like easily by buying a lipstick or a perfume. But in, in order for you to buy into that lipstick and perfume, I have to create this other world to make that lipstick and perfume covetable. So essentially, he's kind of tri- he tri- um, he treated his couture and his ready to wear collections as a as a as like a kind of dreamscape right as something that people can kind of um people can um what's that word called uh, can lust over right they can dream about one day affording like how many girls have you heard say one day they want to be able to afford a, a real chanel bag right um it's that idea of creating these um creating this collection that in, you know stirs up that that feeling inside of you so that you'll then be more willing to buy a, a fucking 30 pound lipstick, right? Because you're going to feel like you're buying into the brand. And then the hope is over time, as you rise up the financial stakes or you get better jobs or you your situation changes in life, you can then start affording the other things. And then it, essentially, Chanel becomes a legacy brand, much like Coca-Cola uh, and all these other things just becomes a brand that you are always associate with luxury. But I just love the idea that he's, he said that luxury isn't your Sunday best. Luxury is wearing the, that shit every single day. And I love that. That's something I've always kind of adopted in, in terms of the clothes that I wear or the things that I buy and how I kind of wear them. I don't treat anything with any kind of specialness, um, right? I hate having shiny clothes, for instance, right? I purposely wash things a few times before I wear it so it gets the kind of like, you know, the brand new shop stain out of it um, or sheen out of it, per se. And Carl Lagerfeld did that in the highest level possible. Um, another quote here as well that I liked from Carl. He said, um, why should I stop working? Um, he mused to anyone who uh, dared breach the subject of his retirement. If I do, I'll die and I'll be finished. And I think that idea of working until you die was something that's only been accepted in the kind of current common, well, in the current conversation, I think of a few years ago, because I remember there was a time, especially, I think it might have been, unbeknownst to him, it might be a consequence of Tim Ferriss's book, The 4-Hour Work Week, where everyone was trying to find a hack or a cheat code that would allow them to work as little as possible and then enjoy, I don't know, uh, I don't know, whiskeys on a beach or some shit, right? No one wanted to, no one wanted to work more than they had to. But then I think in the last few years, what's happened, I think with the evidence of hustle culture, which has been something I've been a big fan of, I think out of the out of the out of the negatives of hustle culture that people don't like, I think the positive of hustle culture have also kind of sprung up. And the positive of hustle culture is that the person that's beating the drum of like work all day, work all night, sleep as sleep as little as you can and do the work. What they're actually saying is that I can do I can sleep for four hours a night. And I can work all around the clock because I'm actually doing something that I love, something that I enjoy. So to me, it's not work, right? And that's something that's very foreign to uh, most people that have an everyday job, right? For, for the most part, most of your friends or most of the people that I know, most of the people that I hang around with, for the most part, for, to, to take a take a title off of um, um, Gruber's book. I forgot his first name, but some surname Gruber. Uh, most of us have bullshit jobs, right? The jobs that we're working at don't necessarily, you know, if we didn't turn up tomorrow, the world wouldn't crumble right our company wouldn't um cease to exist we do we do jobs that essentially um are there just to kind of keep the train moving along right if you kind of leave someone else will kind of slot back in and do your job easily over the period of two weeks in induction um, and for the most part we're working in this place just to make sure we have clothes on our back roofs over our head and belly and food in our bellies which is all well and good but i think 
the hustle culture guys and girls were really coming at odds. There was a big clash happening with the general public because we'd never, we could never in our heads, the general public, right? You can never in your head kind of rationalize how somebody could work a job that they actually loved. It didn't make sense to you, right? It's like, what the fuck? How does that make sense? Especially when it's a, especially when it's their own business, it's an entrepreneurship. You're like, oh, if I had my own business, I wouldn't let anyone, I wouldn't be working all day. I'd let someone run it and I'll be, you know, enjoying uh, cocktails on a beach, right? You, That's the idea that you have. But actually what happens is that from reading what these people say and someone like Carl Lagerfeld saying here, what happens is that eventually when you start working on something that you love, that working for something that you love is actually what's giving you a reason to get up at, get up in the morning. That's giving your life purpose. And all of us human beings, whether you are, whatever denomination you may be, whatever race, creed, um, socioeconomic level, whatever it may be, we all want to have a purpose. We want to feel belonging. We all want to feel like we matter, that we have something that we're doing, whether it's kind of looking after children, whether it's helping out people. We want to feel like we're doing something that gives us a reason to be awake, that gives us a reason to wake up in the morning. And sometimes finding your passion and being able to be, and getting paid for it is one way to do it. So then when someone like Carl Lagerfeld says, um, when someone like when someone like Carl Lagerfeld asks continually, when will you retire? To him, it's kind of it, it seems like a bit of an affront of like as soon as he hears retirement, he hears death because he can't imagine himself not working. The only time he can imagine himself not working is when he's dead. So um, essentially, that kind of way of thinking was something that was definitely a mind blowing thing for me at the time because again, like I said, I've always worked in jobs where I've always had in the back of my head that I don't really like where I am and I'm just doing this for the time being to get to where I want to get to, right? And um, But there was also a part of me that was also kind of a little bit, uh, it used to rub me up the wrong way, the whole hustle, hard hustle until you don't go to don't go to sleep thing used to piss me off because, again, I just think it's a certain kind of personality that can do that. I think it's a bit um, unwise to tell the majority of the world that they should work, you know, ungodly amount of hours because not everyone can do that. But then thinking about it over time, taking a step back and taking myself out of it, I realized that actually what's actually happening is that these people are working on things that they didn't enjoy and they love. So in their head, they don't need that. Um, in their head, working all day doesn't have the negative connotation that it has in my head, which again is something that you have learned from Carl. And lastly, a quote, another quote here from Carl, which I really liked was this. It says, when people talk about the good old days, I say to people, it's not the days, it's not that the days are, it's not that the days are old, it's you that's old. I hate the good old days. What is important is that today is good. And I repeat that. When people talk about the good old days, I say to people, it's not that the days are old, it's you that's old. I hate the good old days and what's important is to, is that the day is good. And I fucking love that quote. Um, I've, I fucking hate nostalgia. I am a big hater of nostalgia. Nostalgia is one of the things that I hate most and it's one of the things that always kind of gets drawn. Always, and it's kind of scum constant source of inspiration in fashion for the most part right everyone's always referencing stuff in archives and taking stuff and sometimes in fashion it can be done in a good way in a right way right where you can kind of you know take on themes and and certain topics that i'll talk about in in the in the archive or shapes or tones or whatever it may be but sometimes it's so copy and pasty the referencing in fashion it can really rub me up the wrong way and in general just in everyday society from flashback fridays to tb to to throwback fridays to whatever everyone's trying to remember the good old days when they were a particular kind of person and for me i think there's no better time than to than right now right in this current moment that we're in and for someone like Carl Lagerfeld to say that, to adopt that kind of way of thinking is incredibly admirable because he could easily, if he wanted to, with the, probably with his eyes closed, design tens of thousands of collections referencing stuff that he's done in the past. Not even referencing stuff that other designers have done because that's, that's another thing that he also was very adamant to do was he kind of, you know, he made sure he um, limited his um, fashion exposure and kind of tried to ref um, re only reference things that were going on inside of his head right it's like so similar to like sampling and hip-hop right he tried not to stop tried to make his own beats from scratch right and it shows in this work right sometimes it showed for the worst it kind of looks a little bit tired and a little bit repetitive but sometimes it showed for the best where he was able to kind of really you know um talk about things that no one was talking about at the time and make them you know uh pop and again i just think it's an admirable point of view to adopt and something that i think he purposely gave himself challenges and hurdles to overcome because essentially he was working you know at the house of chanel he had un um, he had an, an untapped well of resources that he could like plug into 
but he always gave himself these little hurdles he had to jump over in order to kind of work really well in terms of even the sketching thing which is another thing that I was a big fan of he was actually an ardent sketcher he sketched all the time which is something that's been lost nowadays in fashion there's loads of designers that always come there's loads of there's a, you know there's hundreds thousands of designers that come out and say they don't sketch and they just do everything on the body you know it's kind of as a kind of reaction against the um um what you call traditional fashion practices but in general i just think he was an absolute powerhouse um somebody that will be greatly missed i think in the entirety of fashion and again i just don't think we're going to see another guy like him ever again i don't think we're going to be able to see somebody who's going to be able to steer such a ship um <laughs> and appeal to the you know the geeky fashionistas like myself and your average everyday woman on the street um i don't think we'll ever see that ever again but yeah r.i.p um carl lagerford an absolute legend and if you haven't already um check out try and watch as many interviews as you can of his on youtube he's probably one of the best people to listen to when it comes to perspective on life and stuff he's just an amazing dude and again um he will be greatly greatly missed